seconds. There we go. If anyone has any objections to that, please obviously make that clear perhaps through the chat. <clears throat> All right, welcome everybody to this um, event. I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. Um, the event uh, is obviously a virtual Zoom event. Each speaker will have 40 minutes and therefore um, around 30 minutes to present their paper, which will leave around 10 minutes for participants to um, to offer any questions. Now, because of the, the scale of at least the enrolment, although I see um, so far perhaps not the attendance, um, I, I thought the best way to, to manage it as fairly as possible would be simply to invite people to put their questions in writing in the chat. And that way, um, the instant you press return will be the instant that your question is registered. Um, uh, at the end of each session, um, that is at the end of the two hours, those who wish to remain on and if any speakers wish to remain on, perhaps uh, any further discussion can take, take place at that time. Um, I leave that at the discretion of each and all, including uh, the speakers. So I'm coming to you from Boonarong land in, in Melbourne, as I say, um, and I wish to acknowledge the elders past and present. Uh, I welcome you uh, wherever you are, and I know people are coming to this event from all around the world. Thank you so much for being, being part of it. Our first speaker is Matteo Stettler, who is coming to us from Italy. Um, although he is based at my university at Deakin, where he's completing a PhD on protreptic and philosophy as a way of life. And he's going to be presenting a paper on that theme entitled Philosophy, Philosophical Conversion and Progressive Discourse. So, uh, Matteo, at 7.03, our time, and whatever time that is, <laughs> past your hour, the floor Wonderful. is... Wonderful. Allow me to share the screen and please tell me if you can see it. There you go. Okay, wonderful. So, um, uh, Professor Sharp, many thanks for this introduction and um, for having organized this event. As the only PhD student in the panel, I'm extremely humble to be given uh, the chance to open this round of discussion and present um, an extract from my thesis. Uh, by the title, Ancient Philosophy and Ethics, Practice, or a Way of Life, the Controversy on Aristotle. So I would say, uh, let's dive right into it. So I don't think it's too much um, on a, of an oversimplification to say that the field of philosophy as a way of life, as we know it today, was uh, somehow inaugurated in 1981 by the publication of Ardo's groundbreaking collection of essays, uh, Exercice Spirituelle et Philosophie Antique. In the essay after which this collection gets its title, Ado endeavored to reclaim a preeminent role um, for the practice of spiritual exercises in ancient philosophy, and thus reconfigure our understanding of ancient philosophy around the central and often unappreciated notion of conversion. As Ado himself writes, for the ancient philosophers, in fact, quote, philosophy did not consist in teaching an abstract theory, but rather in the art of living. Philosophy, he concludes there, is a conversion which turns in our entire life upside down, end quote. So while eventually influential, of course, Ado's characterization of ancient philosophy as a conversion inextricably tied to the practice of spiritual exercises did not fail to attract also a good deal of skepticism right from the get-go. So in a review of Ado's collection first appeared in 1983, the Swiss medievalist Reddy Imbach challenged Ado's attempt to, quote, perceive the unity of ancient philosophy in an act of conversion ever renewed by spiritual practice, end quote. So Imbach did so precisely by pointing to what he considered as being an important exception to the Adotian picture of ancient philosophy. The author, he writes, referring to Ado, quote, includes Aristotle in his panorama of ancient philosophy. However, 
key questions. Is it really a matter of spiritual exercises with Aristotle? Is it not precisely Aristotle in Bach wonders, the father of a purely theoretical conception which aims at knowledge for the sake of knowledge, end quote. So while Addo will eventually address Imbach's criticism at some length in 1987 in the postface to the second edition of Exercice Spirituel, at that time, unbeknownst to everyone, Imbach's position had already been advanced uh, by none other than Michel Foucault in his 1981-82 lectures at the Collège de France as published under the title Dermenutics of the Subject. There, Foucault mounted a very, very similar case over Aristotle's exceptionalism. He said, there is, of course, the exception Foucault wrote after having provided his own definition of ancient spirituality. Quote, the major fundamental exception, that of the one who called the philosopher because he was no doubt the only philosopher in antiquity for whom the question of spirituality was least important, Aristotle. But as everyone knows, uh, Foucault concludes, Aristotle is not a pinnacle of antiquity, but it's exception, end quote. So while also Foucault's thesis as against Hadot's eventually ended up gaining a considerable uh, support in literature, um, Julius Domanski's take on the issue in La Philosophie Théorie et de Vie cannot readily be subsumed under either lines of interpretations um, insisting, as it does, on the ambiguous status that characterized the Aristotelian model of the relationship between theory and practice, a model that, to his regard, in fact, places the practical and the theoretical parts of philosophy somewhat on the same level. So as I shall discuss in my uh, presentation, what seems to be really at stake in all these characterizations of Aristotle as either an exceptional or at the very least an ambiguous figure in the context of ancient spirituality is nothing less than the very way in which the ancient paradigm of philosophy as a way of life ought to be conceptualized and understood. So as Addo himself most lucidly noted in his article, Ancient Philosophy, An Ethics or a Practice, towards which I gesture um, in the title of my own presentation, it is in fact precisely uh, the borderline and seemingly problematic case of Aristotle that allows us best to capture what ancient, ancient spirituality was all about. So as I shall make the case uh, today, from a Hadotian perspective, the characterization of Aristotle as either uh, again, an exceptional or ambiguous figure in the context of ancient spirituality reveals the limits of the conceptual frameworks uh, by which scholars such as Foucault and Domansky and others have so far understood the ancient conception of philosophy as a way of life, both in terms of their dichotomies of reference and also in terms of the different, um, their different organization of the parts that made up the ancient notion of philosophy, namely the canonical triad, ethics, logic, physics. So let's uh, start right away with the dichotomies of reference, referring, uh, starting with the dichotomy theory practice. So in La Philosophie, Domansky identifies the theoretical component of ancient philosophy with the triad, logic, ethics, physics, and actually describes its practical component what he calls an éthique réalisé, a realized ethics, as an almost additional element to this tripartite system. Thus, according to Domanski, whenever we are dealing with antiquity, we confront to all intents and purposes a quadripartite system of the notion of philosophy, a system composed of physics, logic, and let's say an unrealized ethics, uh, that is to say a theoretical science of manners on the one side. And on the other side, uh, as an almost additional discipline, a realized ethics, which is to say, quote, a science of manner, not only theoretical, but practical, embodied in the manners of the philosopher, an art of living. So in Domansky, we thus find the dichotomy theory practice 
operating both as both an interdisciplinary criterion and an intradisciplinary criterion, which is to say um, a criterion which distinguishes logic, physics, and unrealized ethics from realized ethics, and at the same time, an intradisciplinary criterion, which is to say a criterion which distinguishes ethics, uh, the science of manners, in unrealized and realized. So according to uh, Domansky, these four elements composing the ancient definition of philosophy are arranged by each and every tradition in a hierarchical order, according to what he calls a gradation, a gradation, such that some components play the role of a mere starting point and other components play the role of a, of a goal, of an accomplishment. So it is precisely such gra gradation that to Domansky's regard, the Platonic model render um, highly ambiguous and the Aristotelian model actually uh, completely dispenses with. So in fact, Domansky ascribes Plato two different and apparently irreconcilable models of the relationship theory practice. The first model inspired by the Republic and then inherited by the Stoics. The second derived from the Fido and later appropriated by the Neoplatonists. So the former model having realized ethics as its supreme goal, the latter model as its mere starting point. A difference that I think is uh, analogous to the one that John Sellers uh, sees at work between the so-called Socratic and Aristotelian or humanistic and scientific paradigms of the notion of philosophy as a way of life. So in the Polish scholar's eyes, the Aristotelian model appears no less ambiguous for it offers us no, graduate, no gradation whatsoever, the practical branch of philosophy never being clearly prioritized over uh, the theoretical or vice versa. So actually, a similar position was early on espoused also by Hado, apparently, uh, for whom, quote, in Plato and Aristotle, we do not find a complete classification of the parts of philosophy inspired by the perspective of spiritual progress, end quote. However, unlike, uh, unlike, unlike Domansky for Hado, the fact that neither Plato nor Aristotle systematically arranged the triad ethics, logic, dialectics from a pedagogical or didactic perspective uh, does not exclude that the two Greek philosopher, philosophers did not more formally attempted to distinguish and organize the different branches of philosophy, either from the perspective of methodology and epistemology, or from the point of view of the organization of knowledge. So concerning, uh, especially this latter perspective, as Ado points out, um, both Plato and Aristotle clearly elected a supreme science. Of course, the elective for Plato, as we can see from books six and seven of the Republic, and the theoretical and not practical science of being itself for Aristotle, as we can see from the book Epsilon of the Metaphysics. Um, so at this point, one, I think, may legitimately wonder whether we have not approached precisely here the limits of the Adotian framework and whether this Aristotelian type of classification on top of which there sits the theoretical and uh, the theoretical, uh, theoretical science of being qua being uh, does not provide additional perhaps even conclusive evidence in favor of the thesis of Aristotle's exceptionalism. I think that that would be the case, I think Ado would argue, if we fail to distinguish between the Greek and the corresponding French terms, theoreticus, theorique, theoretique, and theoricus, theorique, whose crucial difference most of the time uh, blunders in the English theoretical. So for Ado, in fact, while the modern acceptation of the term theoretic does indeed designate something opposed to practice, opposed to living, Aristotle himself only uses, uses the word theoretical, and he uses it to designate, on the one hand, the mode of knowledge whose goal is, um, uh, is uh, the mode of knowledge uh, whose goal is knowledge for knowledge's sake, and not some goal outside of itself, and on the other, um, the way of life which is associated with that mode of knowledge. 
In this, in this latter meaning, according to Adol, theoretical, in fact, is not opposed to practical. In other words, he says, he says, quote, theoretical can be applied to a philosophy which is practiced, lived, and active, and which can bring happiness. So as we shall see, it is supposedly, supposedly to avoid this linguistic confusion that when dealing with ancient philosophy, Ado will tend to privilege the dichotomy uh, between uh, philosophical life and philosophical discourse over the dichotomy practice theory. As Ado, in fact, makes clear in what is ancient philosophy, the correspondence between these two dichotomies uh, shouldn't be pushed too far. far as to an identity between them and say, for instance, that every form of this course is ergo solely theoretic, or conversely, that every form of life is ergo solely practical. For precisely as Ador writes, quote, this course can have a practical aspect to the extent that it tends to produce an effect on the listener or the reader. Insofar as the way of life is concerned instead, it cannot of course be theoretic, but it can certainly be theoretical, uh, which is to say contemplative, end quote. So from a Hadotian perspective, by identifying the spiritual component of ancient philosophy with the notion of practice, as Domansky does, we inevitably run the risk of losing sight of the fact that when Aristotle places at the apex of his hierarchical organization of forms of knowledge, the theoretical science of being qua being, he is at the same time elevating to the highest of ranks what uh, he calls, paradoxically enough, a theoretical praxis. That is to say, the fundamental choice of a way of life devoted to nothing other than that form of knowledge. Now let's move rapidly to the other dichotomy that we're gonna um, discuss, which is to say the dichotomy between philosophical life and philosophical discourse. So as I already mentioned, um, Ado's conceptual framework will tend to privilege the dichotomy as originally coined by the Stoics uh, between um, uh, the philosophical life and philosophical discourse, uh, the former corresponding to the lived practice of logic, physics, and ethics, the latter to the theoretical speculations of logic, physics, and ethics. So thus, unlike the dichotomy theory of practice, the broader and more encompassing dichotomy between philosophical discourse and the philosophical life, according to Ado, operates as a purely intradisciplinary criterion. That is to say, it establishes caesuras within each and every discipline composing the triad logic, ethics, physics. So perhaps no one has to date uh, taken greater care than uh, Arnold Ira Davidson to demonstrate how profoundly influential this Hadotian conceptualization of ancient philosophy eventually proved to be for the late Foucault. In fact, according to Davidson, quote, Foucault's discussion of the relation between spirituality and philosophy is the fruit of his encounter with the work of Pierre Hadot on the tradition of spiritual exercises, end quote. So by proposing his own distinction between philosophy and spirituality in their menudics, um, Foucault seems in fact to do nothing more than to recast on the axis subject truth, the Adotian distinction between philosophy or the philosophical form of life and philosophical discourse. In this way, reaching conclusions that, um, as Davidson himself noted, are very close to those of Hadot. So as I shall suggest, two such conclusions um, are the following. Uh, the first is establishing the conversion as the ultimate criterion of what in Adotian terms we refer to as the philosophical way of life or the ultimate criterion of spirituality for Foucault. Uh, and second, the very relationship between philosophy and its own discourse or in Foucauldian terms, philosophy and spirituality. So in the wake of Knox's fundamental study conversion, Hado and following the latter also Foucault will reposition at the center of their readings of, ancient, of the ancient metaphilosophical paradigm uh, the theme of conversion. The simplest and most fundamental formula by which spirituality can be defined, Foucault writes in the hermeneutics of the subject, 
is that, quote, the truth is only given to the subject at the price that brings the subject's being into play. It follows, he concluded there, that from this point of view, there can be no truth without conversion or a transformation of the subject, end quote. So moreover, according to Hadot, not only philosophical discourse is intimately linked to the philosophical life, but uh, the philosophical life, life is assured uh, in his conceptual framework, an order of precedence over philosophical discourse. For as Hadot writes, quote, philosophical discourse originates in a choice of life and an existential option and not vice versa, end quote. So again, following very closely the Adotian framework, Foucault himself believes that, quote, throughout antiquity, the philosophical theme on the one side and the question of spirituality on the other were never separate. Even though also for Foucault, quote, philosophy's most important preoccupation in antiquity centered around the self, which is a, say, spirituality, uh, with knowledge of the world, coming after and serving most often to support the carousel, to support spirituality. So now let's move to the triad ethics, logic, physics. As we shall now see, in fact, the way in which Hadot and Foucault inscribe their respective dichotomies into the triad ethics, logic, physics profoundly differs. Somewhat simplifying even further the Damascan system, it seems that Foucault conceives the dichotomy spirituality philosophy as a purely interdisciplinary criterion, one dividing ethics from logic and physics. In fact, one way in which the divergences between Hadot and Foucault's interpretation of ancient spirituality might be reformulated, as Davidson once again has uh, attentively noted, is by saying that, quote, Foucault limited the care of the self which is to say the sphere of spirituality, to ethics alone. Foucault was not able uh, to see the full scope of spiritual exercises, that physics, as much as ethics, aimed at self-transformation, Davidson concludes. So Davidson's take on the Hadot-Foucault confrontation on this point, I think, have much, uh, has much to recommend it, and at the same time, at least as much to oppose it. Let's see. Why? So Federico Testa is certainly right uh, when, in a work that indirectly qualifies Davidson's statement, um, points, points out that Foucault does discuss at some length in their minutics of the subject the transformative role of physics that physics could play in ancient philosophy. However, I think that we must qualify that for Foucault. Um, the transformative role played by physics is entirely predicated on what he calls, with varying terminology, a spiritual modality, a spiritualization, or a spiritual modalization of the criterion of philosophy, which is to say of knowledge, rather than on the criterion of spirituality, which is to say the conversion. So this is all, this is all to say that insofar as Foucault has the discipline of physics belonging exclusively to the sphere of philosophy, which is to say to the exclusion of the sphere of spirituality. And insofar as Foucault defined physics entirely in terms of knowledge, uh, the discipline of physics for him per se does not aim at conversion. So this is particularly evident if we take a look at Foucault's reading of the Hellenistic Roman an especially stoic schema of the relation between philosophy and spirituality, between knowledge of the world, physics, and conversion to the self, which is to say ethics. The objective of traditional stoic morality, Foucault argue, uh, argues in their menutics, uh, quote, can only be met and accomplished at the cost of the knowledge of nature. We can only arrive at the self by having passed through the great cycle of the world, end quote. So we see here that um, the order of precedence that Foucault, very much like Hadot, establishes amongst philosophy and spirituality is here transposed on the organization of the parts of philosophy, 
in such a way that physics, which is here defined entirely in terms of the criteria of philosophy as knowledge of the world, um, is now subordinated to ethics, uh, which is defined entirely according to the criteria of spirituality as conversion to the self. So we can almost see more, more, more clearly see where the complex differences between the Foucauldian and the Hadotian frameworks stand and how the former engenders, I think, a second problem in interpreting uh, Aristotle's place in ancient spirituality. So although both Hadot and Foucault recognize that physics may aim at conversion, at a personal transformation, the two scholars diverge considerably when it comes to account for the spiritual modality by virtue of which the sphere of physics may be considered transformative or spiritual. In fact, differently from what Davidson and other commentators have recently suggested, I think that what Ado intended by a lived physics or physics as a spiritual exercise is certainly not the same as what Foucault called by the formula spiritual knowledge or any of its variants. If it's certainly true, as Davidson argues, that, quote, there is no devaluation of discourse as discourse in Hado, and there is no devaluation of knowledge as knowledge in Foucault, um, at the same time, it does not seem to be accurate to say, as Davidson does, uh, that for both scholars, quote, it is a matter of a modalization, modalization of discourse as a spiritual exercise in Hado and modalization of knowledge as spiritual knowledge in Foucault. In fact, Foucault's very idea of a spiritual modalization of knowledge is actually predicated on a conceptual model that Hadot himself uh, strenuously tried to disentangle his own interpretation of ancient spirituality from, namely, the model of a practical application of a theory. So um, I think this extract from the present alone is our happiness is actually very instructive in this regard. Mm. Um, uh, allow me to quote from it. So despite my attempts to avoid it, uh, Ado tells us, some of what I've written about spiritual exercises in general may suggest that spiritual exercises are added to philosophical theory, to philosophical discourse, that they would be practice that merely complements theory and abstract discourse. In fact, all philosophy is an exercise. All philosophy is an exercise, instructional discourse, no less than the inner discourse that orients our actions. This is very important for me, Ado tells us, insofar as my my main preoccupation. So my main preoccupation has been precisely to show that what was considered to be pure theory, abstraction, was practice in both its mode of exposition and its finality, end quote. So we see that Ado's intention, one that evidently remains utterly extraneous to Foucault, was precisely to demonstrate that even the theoretical discourse of physics was already, which is to say, before any spiritual spiritualization of knowledge being needed, an integral part of a lived practice, namely of lived physics. Thus, from Ado's perspective, by identifying spirituality exclusively with ethics to the exclusion of the other parts of philosophy, physics in primis, as Foucault does, we run the risk of ignoring that physics is uh, transformational, not only when spiritualized, but this discipline belongs right from the beginning, ab initio, to the sphere of spirituality. So by doing this, I think the Foucauldian framework blinds us to the rather important fact that, that the theoretical discourse of Aristotelian metaphysics, for instance, was an integral part of the practice of lived physics. Uh, this is an even more radical disagreement than it might seem at first sight, actually. In fact, for Hadot, it is not just the case that physics did not merely pertain to the sphere of philosophy and, its, and the criterion of knowledge, as Foucault had argued, nor precisely because of that was the transformational role that physics played in antiquity simply not predicated 
on the etopoietic inflection of cosmological theories. Even more, actually, from Adot's perspective, in both these cases, what Foucault had argued concerning the transformational potential of physics is not simply not the case, but it is the opposite, opposite that it is the case. Um, in fact, according to Adot, physics belonged from the beginning and with full rights to the sphere of spirituality because the primary and most elemental relation that existed between philosophy and its own discourse in antiquity was not that of a spiritual modelization of knowledge with the aim of conversion, as Foucault had argued, but that of what we might call a philosophical modalization of the experience of conversion for the purpose of knowledge. Thus, we should really be talking about, uh, we should not really be talking about a spiritualization or a spiritual modalization of knowledge as Foucault does, but in keeping with the terms of the discussion, we should be really talking about a philosophization or a philosophical modalization of conversion. As Ado writes, in fact, in one of his essays on conversion, quote, in antiquity, philosophy was essentially conversion. It is beginning from this fundamental fact that Western philosophy has developed and it has been forced to elaborate a physics or a metaphysics of conversion, end quote. So we may now better appreciate another subtle and yet fundamental difference between the Hadotian and the Foucauldian frameworks. Although both Hadot and, and Foucault recognize uh, the precedence of spirituality over philosophy, of the philosophical life over philosophical discourse, the two French scholars conceive the nature of such precedence in different ways. So while for Foucault, the subordination of philosophy to spirituality is merely teleological, which is to say the telos of knowledge is conversion. For Foucault, the sub, for Hadot, uh, pardon me, the subordination of the philosophical discourse to the philosophical life is primarily a genealogical one, which is to say the genus, the origin of knowledge is conversion. Matteo, just to let you know, it's 30 minutes. Yeah, um, I'm gonna wrap this up. So this finally, I think, explains the most fundamental difference between what Foucault called spiritual knowledge and Hadot lived physics, and upon which presuppositions, their different conception of spirituality are founded. So whereas for Foucault, it is because of this teleology of conversion that the knowledge of physics can acquire a spiritual value in the first place. For Hadot, it is arguably because of this genealogy of metaphysics, let's say, that uh, metaphysics can be considered to be, right from the beginning, let's say, an inherently spiritual endeavor. So it does seem that the current pass in literature over Aristotle's spirituality was, at least in part, engendered by the limits of the conceptual framework whereby ancient spirituality is currently being understood. So whether it be because of the identification of the spiritual component of ancient philosophy with the notion of practice or with the sphere of ethics, Domansky and Foucault's conceptual frameworks both fail to account for the theoreticality of the way of life advocated by Aristotle and the inherent spirituality of metaphysics. However, I think Ado's own argument concerning the inherent spirituality of Aristotelian metaphysics uh, would have been complete, and his say um, over these controversies uh, would have been the final one. Um, I would say, if and only if, by his own conceptual standards, he had managed to demonstrate that Aristotle's metaphysics that in, does indeed have its roots in an originary choice of life or an act of conversion. Uh, which is something that, as far as I know, I never, I never got around to accomplish. I think that it would be only by verifying whether um, this genetic primacy of the experience of conversion over metaphysics holds in Aristotle's case that will be justified in reclaiming spirituality as an inherent feature of the Stagirite's philosophy. While, of course, I won't practically be able to pursue such a demanding task here, um, I do want to suggest a possible way out of this conundrum very rapidly in conclusion of my uh, presentation. So of all 
of Aristotle's writing, I think that the obvious point of reference for this scholarly feat cannot fail to be represented by the Protracticus, the exhortation that Aristotle wrote to entice the Cypriot king Temison to embark on the contemplative life. As Sophie van der Meren noted, I think, uh, quote, the origin and meaning of the Protractics to philosophy is indeed um, closely related to the phenomenon of conversion, end quote. In this perspective, as the French scholar uh, herself noted, in fact, we could hardly make sense of the incredible popularity that this literary genre enjoyed throughout the ancient world, or of the success that Aristotle's own Protrepticus met until the beginning of the Middle Ages, if we don't keep in mind as the French scholar tells us, quote, that ancient philosophy, as the analysis of Pierre Hadot have reminded us, is first of all, a way of life, even a contemplative one, which the philosopher invites others to undertake, a way of life which the philosopher exhorts its reader to convert to, to, um, to turn to, to embark upon, by means precisely of a protractic discourse. So now I would invite you uh, to offer your feedback on this very presentation, which is now over. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Matteo. Now we have about six minutes for, for questions. Um, as I say, it might be easiest because of the, the number here um, that we use the chat function. So. Caleb has um, begun the process and I see Michael Chase as well. So Matteo, if you can open your chat, you can see that Caleb's asking sure. a question there concerning, it seems crucial to me, he says that mm -hmm. Aristotle contemplating involves noose mm -hmm. becoming its objects in a way, i.e. in contemplating the divine, your intellect becomes like the divine. In this sense, theoretical contemplation is in its nature transformative, affecting what you are. Um, if you read forward with that, do you have any? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. absolutely. Yeah, I can see that. Um, there isn't an additional telos beyond the contemplation itself, but rather the contemplation itself changes you. Do you agree that we need to focus on Aristotle's views on contemplation to understand Aristotle's theoretic of life as a spiritual and a philosophical one? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think um, uh, this makes perfect sense. I, I, I wouldn't have anything to, uh, to I, I don't really have anything to disagree there. Um, it's actually a very uh, interesting point that you're making. I'm actually moving now uh, to the study of, um, to the study of the paradigm of ancient of, of philosophy as a way of life as it was inherited um, through various uh, ways by this, the so-called magistri, so-called uh, masters of the arts and um, in, the, in, Paris, in, in the University of Paris in the 13th century. And um, that very conception of contemplative philosophy hinges upon um, the, according to many in, in Latin of Arism, hinges upon the copulatio, the so-called Conjunct also, I think that's also another term which is relevant, uh, with the separate substances. Uh, that apparently was, um, um, uh, of course, an Aristotelian um, ideal uh, that was filtered through Arabic sources and then apparently reemerged in uh, the medieval period. But I think so, that's absolutely re relevant uh, to the discussion. and. Uh, I'm certainly going to consider this as I go forward in my research. Thank you, uh, Colin. Michael Chase has a question or questions. <clears throat> Does Hado really talk about spirituality mm -hmm. as against, if not, I guess? Yes, if not, what, uh, why not? Yeah. Uh, what does Pierre Hado means by live physics? Isn't it cosmic consciousness? Yes, exactly. Uh, um, that's uh, absolutely true. Although it does not speak of spirituality, that's um, the technical term that um, Foucault actually uses. Uh, although I would say the, um, the corresponding element to what Foucault cor calls spirituality in 
Hado's conceptual framework is the philosophical way of life or the conversion. Um, uh, by lived physics, uh, what I take Ado to mean by lived physics is the the lived part, which is certainly the attempt to experience cos cosmic consciousness, to the realization of being part of the whole, let's say, as he puts it. And as far as I understand that, that's um, one of the components into which physics can be uh, distinguished. So we have lived physics, cosmic consciousness, and on the other side, you know, the speculations on uh, the natural world, cosmological theories, etc. Yes, uh, I think I hopefully I sufficiently answer to that question. Um, uh, is there, um, there's probably time for one more question. Uh, Lucas has a comment which I think really um, speaks to go, Yes, let's see. I um, even go further and suggest that for Ado, contemplation is, in a broader sense, is the philosophical mode of knowledge par excellence because it is the mode of knowledge in which you have to become similar to its object in order to know it. Just a side commentary and discussion. Ah, okay, I see that. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what to say about that? Uh, perhaps that's a little bit of a stretch, I would say. Um, but I think what's, what, it, what was important for me is to, to see how uh, Hado's take on, uh, actually, Hado's reading of Aristotle, uh, that shapes the very conception of philosophy as a way of life that he had. It is, again, it is precisely by turning to Aristotle to this figure that uh, seems to represent um, a sort of exception, in fact, to, the, to his thesis that the entirety of ancient philosophy was a way of, with, in, in the entirety of ancient philosophy, philosophy was conceived as a way of life um, that we, it's exactly to this figure that we should turn to, um, to define our conceptual framework uh, by means of which to understand ancient flaws. Theo, thank you very much for your, thank you to all of your yeah. responses to the questions and thank you to, to everyone who's posted in the chat. I, I feel like we should move on. Um, as it is thank you for everybody. 44 yep. past. Thank you so much, Matteo, for such a wonderful beginning. Um, we, we do have some, some continuing chat going on, which I think can continue perhaps um, in the context of, of the developing discussions of the week. Um, and also, they're on record, and Matteo, perhaps you can take them on notice uh, as well. One of the correspondents, if that's the word, on chat is in fact our next speaker, um, Massimo Pigliucci, who will be known to, to many of you, I'm sure. He's a professor of philosophy at the City University in New York. He's had a very large role in modern Stoicism. And he's also the author of uh, a recent book uh, entitled The Quest for Character, What the Story of Socrates and Alcibiades Teaches Us About Our Search for Good Leaders. Speaking of which, I should probably stick my video on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but Massimo is talking to us today about a turn that he has taken uh, I think it's fair to say, in the last 12 to 24 months. And that turn is perhaps away from Stoicism's um, simpliciter towards something else. And the title of his talk is Can Skepticism Be a Way of Life? Lessons from Cicero. So, Massimo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen and we'll get started. Um... Here we go. So yeah, this this is a, a work in progress. It literally, this talk is actually kind of an outline of a project that I just started. I'm uh, today. It happens to be I'm here at City College in New York. It happens to be the last day of my semester, which means that unofficially my sabbatical starts tomorrow. And and this is the project that I'm going to devote uh, the next year or so to. So this will be a very preliminary thing. Uh, hopefully, it will be more than enough time for a uh, uh, discussion afterwards. I'm more than welcome uh, feedback. Actually, let me get out of here for a second and change my screen. Otherwise, I'm going to see you guys instead of my slides, and that would not be a good thing. 
there it is. So the question that I'm, one of the questions that I'm interested in is, is whether skepticism can be a philosophy of life as opposed to, for instance, uh, Ado uh, sometimes characterizes it as more of an attitude or a spiritual attitude, in fact, uh, rather than, than a full-fledged philosophy. So here I want to explore whether that's correct or not. Spoiler alert, I actually think it is a philosophy of life. In fact, there are two versions of it, uh, as you'll see in a moment, and as I'm sure many people here know. And I will, after introducing both of them, I'll actually focus only on the one that I'm going to pursue uh, during my upcoming project. So first of all, I guess the, the, the basic question that we want to address is what is a philosophy of life in the first place? And as you've just heard, there are these disagreements on, on, on even some of the, the basics. Here's my very simplified version of um, how I see things. I think that ideally, if not practically, although it will turn out to be also practical in most cases, but ideally, a philosophy of life has three components. One that, broadly speaking, we might refer to as the metaphysics, meaning an account of how the world works. So either a metaphysics or a natural philosophy, a science, whatever you want to call it, but a general idea of how uh, the world works. The, the term metaphysics, in this case, I think it's the broadest possible. It also has, of course, to have an ethics, also understood very broadly uh, as a set of principles or guidelines that we use in order to conduct our lives, interact with other people, uh, set our goals, set our standards, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, a set of practices or what Ado calls spiritual exercises. That is a way for us to apply the principles that come out of the ethics, which themselves are informed by the metaphysics uh, to day-to-day -day life. Notice here, logic doesn't appear um, uh, so explicitly, but it is kind of implied in the background. I mean, you can't do any of that without the logic, without the, the dialectic part of it. So let's, let me show you a few examples. Um, taken from what people usually consider either religions or philosophies or both. I don't actually think that there is a fundamental distinction between a religion or a philosophy of life. Um, and, you know, we can have that discussion, of course, um, at the end of the presentation. But so this table is going to present a, three examples of religion or philosophy, and then a brief sort of summary or overview of their metaphysics, ethics, and practices in order to make my case that, in fact, these three components are present pretty much in um, most, at least, of the philosophies of life that we uh, can discuss. So let's start with the obvious one, Christianity. I grew up in Rome, literally next door to the Pope. Well, not quite literally, but pretty close. And therefore, you know, I consider myself a Catholic, Christian Catholic since when I, when I was young. Now, Christianity has a metaphysics, of course, which includes, among other things, the existence of a benevolent God that created the world, is outside the world in some sense, et cetera, et cetera. It obviously includes an ethics based on the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament, the teaching of Jesus from the New Testament, um, and a number of other sources. And then there are practices. I mean, when I was a Catholic, I never thought of them as practices, but they, that's clearly what they are. Praying, communal activities, you know, going to church, reading scriptures, meditating on scriptures, uh, interacting with other practitioners and discussing issues, uh, all of that, all of those things are practices. Buddhism. Whether you want to think of Buddhism or Buddhisms, I would say plural, because there is a, a large variety of them after two and a half millennia of history. But whatever you want to think of it as a religion or a philosophy, I don't think it matters much in terms of the, the current um, discussion. But it has a metaphysics, things like cycles of birth and rebirth, karma, and so on and so forth. It has an ethics, the four noble truths, the hateful path, etc. And of course, it has practices, meditation, different kinds of meditation to deflate your ego, loving kindness, meditation, et cetera, et cetera. And then the one that, that I'm more familiar in practicing, uh, in practicing is Stoicism. Of course, there is a metaphysics there as well. There is a universal notion of cause and effect, physicalism, um, depending on whether we're talking about ancient or modern Stoicism, there is a uh, notion of uh, the cosmos as a living organism or not, et cetera. <clears throat> 
In terms of ethics, you can look at the four cardinal virtues and how they're deployed as a moral compass. You can look at the three disciplines of Epictetus, which is my favorite way of looking at Stoicism and so forth. And then in terms of practices, you have things that we are familiar with, philosophical journaling or diary, various kinds of meditations, although the term has a different meaning than it does in Buddhism, exercises in self-restraint, that sort of thing. So I think it's by example, uh, this shows that, in fact, there isn't that much of a fundamental distinction between what I would consider religions or philosophies of life, and that all of them tend to have these three components. So then the question, of course, is going to be, well, does skepticism have those components as well? Now, skepticism has a somewhat um, mixed reputation at best in modern times. Here is a cartoon from the walk that says, Welcome National Society of Skeptics. And the first guy says, I don't believe we met. The second guy says, I don't believe we don't, you don't believe we met, um, which is, you know, hyper skepticism is, is, is being skeptical for the hell of being uh, dubious about other people. But of course, that's not really what skepticism is or what even the word means, right? The, the, the term comes from the Greek ultimately, and it means inquiring or reflecting on things. So a skeptic is somebody who keeps asking questions and inquiring into things, never assuming necessarily that he's got to the end of, of that inquiry. It's always open to uh, new possibilities and to new ways of considering things. Skepticism has in various forms, a very, very long history, of course. In one way or another, all these characters that you're gonna see on this slide and the next two may be considered skeptics, although, as I said, in various forms, uh, these, of course, are all familiar to us from uh, the ancient world, mostly uh, from Greece, but, you know, we're scattering our Romans thereby. Uh, we get to the Middle Ages, uh, sorry, to the Renaissance and, and early modern times, and we have a number of other philosophers that have been identified, at least partially in some respects, with skepticism, including especially Montaigne and David Hume. When it comes to modern skeptics, um, the situation gets more complicated. All these people that are represented here might not be familiar to this particular audience. These are where our people actually think of themselves explicitly as skeptics. Uh, and they use the word in, in an epistemological sense, in the sense of being skeptical of certain things, I mean, inquiring into the nature of the world. Um, particularly, a lot of these people have been involved in um, debates about uh, what is considered reasonably or not depending on who you, you ask to, uh, pseudosciences. But as it turns out, I met all of these people I know, uh, well, except for Bertrand Russell, and, I, and I, I know what they're doing and how they're thinking. And in fact, I think actually they do subscribe to a philosophy of life that is very similar to uh, certain versions of ancient skepticism. So there are modern skeptics and there are actually more out there than one might think. And likely also, as you can see, the third slide, it's slightly more diverse than the previous two. Now, in ancient Greco-Roman philosophy, of course, there are two fundamental kinds of skepticism. There's Pyrrhonism on the one hand, that's Pyrrha on the left, and Sextus Empiricus on the right. And then there is so-called academic skepticism, Carneades on the left, and Cicero on the right. Academic because it took over for, for a period um, what uh, was started as Plato's Academy. Now, very briefly, uh, here's a sketch, a comparative sketch of these two philosophies. So they both have an epistemology of, uh, of some sort. Um, in the one case, in the case of Pyrrhon, uh, this is, here's the notion that there is no firm support for opinions or dogmata, as they were called, outside of evident matters. Um, and it's not entirely clear to me exactly what the distinction is between evident matters and non-evident matters, but apparently Peter had something in mind, and so did Sextus. Um, so once you make that distinction, the notion is that for a lot of non-evident matters, which certainly included questions, philosophical questions like what is the chief good and what makes for a eudaimonic life and so on and so forth, those are clearly non-evident non matters. Um, then there is no firm support because, of course, uh, people can argue uh, well and strongly on both sides of an issue or multiple sides of an issue. On the other side, we have a, uh, the academic skeptics who, on the other hand, maintain that certain knowledge is not achievable 
And that's because both senses and reason are fallible. And those are the only two sources of knowledge that, uh, that we have. And because they're fallible, we can never be certain that we actually do have knowledge. That, from the point of view of the Pyrrhonists, actually counts as a dogma in itself. So the, there's one group of skeptics telling another that they were actually dogmatic. They both had practices. In the case of the Pyrrhonists, famously, uh, the notion was of a poke, the, the idea that we should suspend judgment on all non-evident matters. As far as the evident matters are concerned, we can still act in, in life uh, because we have uh, our media sensorial experiences, we have, we, we uh, were subject to our own in, inner drives such as hunger and thirst and so on and so forth. And there is also, uh, you know, common, common, uh, practices in the society that we live in, which we should simply follow. And there is also a way to learn technical or uh, stuff or arts by practice from, from, from people that actually know about them. But as far as non-evident matters are concerned, we should suspend judgment. For the academics, on the other hand, uh, the idea is to arrive at tentative opinions based on um, what we would today characterize as probability um, the term used by Carnitas was pitanon, which usually translates as persuasiveness. I'll get back to this in a minute because I want to talk more about the academics in, in a minute. And then finally, in terms of ethics, uh, generally speaking, for a Pyrrhonist, the goal is a life of tranquility of mind. So essentially ataraxia, which happens to be the same goal as the Epicureans. But on the other hand, for at least some of the academic skeptics, certainly Cicero, um, the goal is, is to exercise practical wisdom of phrenesis, to live a life, an ethical life, a life, a life of virtue uh, that is informed by practical wisdom. Now, of these two, I'm going to set aside the Pyrrhonists, probably to the chagrin of some in the audience, but um, since my project is mostly on the academic skeptics, I will, from now on, I will be talking about that second type of, of skepticism in terms of, again, of the question that I'm raising today, which is, is this kind of approach a, a, a philosophy of life, an actual philosophy of life, or is it an attitude, a philosophical attitude toward, you know, an essentially epistemological attitude? Now, things get, get complicated because as it turns out, it's not like there's this sharp distinction necessarily that I just made out between Pyrrhonism and academic skepticism. And that's because Arcesilaus was the guy that started the skeptic turn in, in the academy. Uh, and yet he was a student of Piro. And uh, he, he basically introduced uh, essentially a Pyrrhonian system into the academy initially. So according to a number of commentators, including Saxus himself, uh, Arcesilaus' philosophy was initially at least essentially indistinguishable from Pyrrhonism. So the, the the skeptic term was really a Pyrrhonist term. But then things got more complicated. Um, the academy uh, became more moderate or more dogmatic, depending on who you ask, of course. Um, and that meant that through a succession of, of um, uh, heads of the academy uh, that, are, that are listed here on this, on this slide, we get to positions that are more interesting, more interesting because they're more distinct from, from Pyrrhonism. Arguably here, the, the pivotal figure is that of Carniades, who is shown there right in the middle. He was, from what we can tell, because he didn't write anything there, uh, the most innovative and, and uh, um, clearly distinctive of the skeptic, uh, academic skeptics. The, other central character that, in fact, I'm going to focus mostly on during my project and during the uh, uh, forthcoming year is actually Marcus Tullius Cicero. He was uh, famously the first Roman philosopher to really deserve that name. Um, he was a philosopher in his own right, uh, not just, he wasn't just popularizing Greek philosophy. Uh, he did come up with a number of original positions of his own. But fundamentally, he considered himself an academic skeptic. And in fact, he was first very often in his writings to Carniades. Now, to understand Cicero's philosophy, we also have to take a look at who his influences were and who he was taught by. 
And uh, these people show themselves by their own affiliation. It's a pretty clear pattern here. Uh, Philo of Larissa, for instance, uh, who rejected skepticism in favor of Platonism. Antiochus, who rejected skepticism and embraced some kind of eclectic syncretism of Platonism, Aristotelianism, and Stoicism, which was actually essentially uh, Cicero's own position. And Posidonius, who was a middle Stoic, but he was himself eclectic. He accepted both elements of both Platonism and Aristotelianism in his in his view of things. So you can, once you look at this slide, you will, you will not be surprised to find out that Cicero is often considered an eclectic, and that he himself very clearly thought that um, he could come up with a synthesis of the three big ones: Aristotelianism, Platonism, and Stoicism. Now, Cicero's grand plan, what I call his grand plan, um, hinged on five writings and four fundamental questions. And this will become relevant again to answering the question underlying this talk, which is, is this a philosophy, a fully fledged philosophy of life? First, how do we know? That's, the, of course, the epistemological question, right? Unless, especially if you're a skeptic, unless you answer that question, you're not going anywhere. Um, that one is treated at least in part uh, or mostly in the Academica, uh, which unfortunately is, comes up comes to us only in uh, uh, in part. Second, what should we care about? That is, what are the ends, uh, the, the 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 stuff that really is important in life, and that's of course in the finibus bonorum et malorum on the ends of good and evil. Third. How are we to behave? You know, so once that we know, we answer, we have decent answers to the question of how do we know things, and therefore to the first important question, which is how do what do we care about? What are we supposed to be caring about? Then it follows that we can ask ourselves how to behave in practice within this general framework um, of what do we care about. That's addressed in the offices on duties, and then finally. Cicero is important because it's one of the few, not the only one, certainly, but one of the few philosophers of the time that from a very practical perspective uh, asks the question of how do we build a just state? So it doesn't just ask how do we behave individually, which is, for instance, what the Stoics and the Epicureans tend to do, um, but how do we how do we set up things structure in what we would today call a structural sense? And he tries to answer those that, that question in two books, the Republica and the Legibus, which are so on, on the Republic and on the laws, <clears throat> which are both direct response responses to Plato's books by the same titles, right? The Republic and the laws. And the big difference here, consciously so, and consciously so between Cicero and Plato is that Plato goes very theoretical and very speculative. Well, on the other hand, so he builds, you know, he tries to build this ideal republic, at least according to his standards. While Cicero, as any good Roman would be, is very practical. He starts out with a practical example, uh, with the example, the actual example of the Roman Republic, and then he asks himself, okay, how do we improve on this uh, model that we already know actually can be put into practice, has been put into practice for centuries? How do we make it even better? So briefly about the three, the, the, the questions that I just outlined as part of Cicero's big, pro, big program. How do we know? Well, uh, as I said earlier, the academic skeptics uh, criterion here for knowledge is um, Cornelius Pitanon, which Cicero interestingly translates as probab probabilis, which is the root, of course, of the English word pro probability. Uh, this diagram that you're looking at is from Long and Sedley's The Hellenistic Philosophers, and does a good job at, at explaining the general idea, I think. So we face an impression, look at the right side of the, of the, of the diagram, because the left side has to do with whether the impression is in an absolute sense, true or false, but we don't have access to that kind of absolute sense. We don't have a God's eye view of things. So we're concerned with the right side of the diagram. And so relative to the percipient, that is relative to us, an impression may be uh, at the lowest level of um, plausibility or probability, may be apparently true. That is, you know, the kind of thing that you say, oh yeah, other things being equal, I, I think that's that sounds that sounds reasonable. But you're not, but it's you don't have a high degree of confidence on that. The next level is what um, 
Cicero and Sass Carnitas refer to as convincing or intensely apparent. That is, now, now your level of confidence begins to increase. It's it's a little, you're a little more, more uh, confident about uh, your understanding of that impression. The third level is underverted. Underverted means that not only it is it's an impression that is very convincing, but it is also coherent with everything else we know uh, about that subject matter. And so it's reinforced basically by the fact that it fits with, with everything else we think we know about whatever it is that, uh, that we are considering. And then finally, the highest level possible of, of plausibility is the thoroughly explored impression. That's an impression where not only it's prima facie convincing, not only it is it coheres with everything else we think we know, but we've also, we personally or, or, or others in general, have also spent a significant amount of time thoroughly exploring, you know, experimenting on, inquiring about, et cetera, et cetera. So that this is the highest possible level of confidence. So there are these four qualitative levels of confidence. And I'm going to suggest, or I'm thinking of suggesting that a modern interpretation could be in terms of Bayesian uh, epistemology, where uh, I don't want to go into details because of you know, limited time on how Bayesianisms work, but I'm happy to discuss it if people are interested in, but basically, Bayesianism is a way of, based on probability theory, of updating your beliefs uh, every time that evidence or new arguments come in. And I think that this is not, not far from what um, the academic skeptics might have had in mind. Certainly Hume had much later on something very similar in mind. So you could reinterpret what I just said about Carnitas and Cicero as saying that, you know, if you want to put numbers on it, for instance, that um, something when it's apparently true it seems simply more probable than not. So you give it a probability of you know higher than 0.5, but it's not very high. You're not going to bet a lot of money on that concept. If something is convincing, that is, it appears very likely to be true, then your probability estimate goes up, let's say higher than 75%. The numbers are, of course, all indicative. I'm not suggesting any precision here. So if, if an impression, on the other hand, is, reaches the third level, it's underverted, and it coheres with everything else that we, we know, and it has mutually corroborating factors, then, then my confidence is very high. Now it, it's above, let's say, 90%. And finally, the thoroughly explored uh, has been subjected, the impression that has been subjected to meticulous uh, testing and inquiry, then I might be as confident as 99% or more. Note, of course, that you're never reached 100%, because if you reach 100%, both according to academic epistemology and to Bayesianism, you are in the territory of faith, not of, of uh, reasonable, reasonable belief. Once you reach 100%, there is no way for you actually to change your mind, essentially. The second question was, what should we care about? So now that we have a general idea of how to go about in, uh, investigating things, how do what does that tell you about how do we care what we, care, what we should care about? So this is done on ends, right? Now here Cicero goes essentially stoic for the stoic answer. Although he, he's at pains in in a number of his books to say that you know the stoics is not really that different from Platonism or Aristotelianism, you know it's all one one big family. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But the fact of, uh, of the matter is that Cicero settles for the notion that virtue is the chief good, vice is the chief evil, and everything else is morally indifferent. It has value, but it's morally indifferent. Now, that to me sounds pretty much like the Stoic position. And sure enough, it's not by any chance that a lot of the writings of, of Cicero are in fact about Stoicism or the Stoic position, not about Platonism, not about Aristotelianism. The third question, how to behave. So now that we know how to assess the likelihood of things and now that we know what the big the big important things are in life then then what is what is what follows from that here uh Cicero suggests that there is only an apparent conflict between this is on in on duties between what is virtuous and what is beneficial um and that whenever we do something that is beneficial to us, it's also virtuous and vice versa. Why? Because if we do anything that is not virtuous, we're going to undermine our own character. And therefore, we're doing something that, in fact, is not ultimately beneficial for ourselves. 
He follows the four cardinal virtues or practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance. Um, and again, in that sense, although those, those virtues are actually mentioned in Plato, uh, essentially is, is again, a stoic for all effective purposes. And now finally, how do we build a just state? You know, now that we have a bigger, you know, better picture of all the other questions. Um, well, what Cicero suggests is that the best system of government is a, a mix of the elements of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. That doesn't sound very appealing to modern thinkers, but in fact, we do have our modern systems that are in fact kind of a mix of those, so long as you interpret those words in a very, in a fairly loose fashion. I mean, obviously we don't have monarchs and we don't have an aristocracy per se, but we do have, especially in the United States, a, a strong uh, presidential figure. We have, a, you know, remember that aristocracy means rule of the best, at least in theory, the people that we elect to Congress are supposed to be the best. And there is, of course, an element of democracy because we do elections. Again, as I said, the, the model here is the ancient Roman Republic, where, in fact, the three uh, components were pretty clearly in, in, in evidence at play, right? The consuls, the two consuls were the major political figures uh, and holding the, 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 the major part of the power in the ancient Republic. Caesar himself became one a consul during his career, at the apex of his political career. Uh, they were elected, and they were their, their charge lasted one year. Then there was a Senate, which was a mix of appointments and elections, elected individuals, and it was permanent unless impeached. And then there were tribunes, who were again either elected or appointed, depending on the type of tribunes and whose charge lasted between one and five years, again, depending on the type of tribunes. So this, so you can see that the model that he had in mind was a very practical one, was in fact the model that he was literally living in his life. Also, what Cicero tells us in the, so the, the first part of what I just discussed is of course in the Republic, in uh, on le uh, the Legibus on the laws, he tells us that positive law, that is human law, the kind of law that we pass in the Senate, in the in the, uh, in the House of in the, the chambers of of, of uh, Parliament, must reflect natural law. Now, the concept of natural law here would would lead us to a very long discussion that I don't have the time to do here, of course, to pursue here. But basically, the notion of natural law, so this idea that there are some things that really are, generally speaking, independently of human opinion, right or wrong, just or unjust, is common not only to Cicero and some of the Greco-Roman traditions, but certainly to the Christian traditions throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, and even to modern philosophies and modern practical applications. Philippe Foot is one of the modern philosophers who uh, accepts some one version or another of natural law. Uh, things like the United Nations Declarations of Human Rights also accepts implicitly at least the notion of natural law. If you do not accept the notion of natural law, then it's hard to make sense of phrases like this law is unjust. This human law is unjust. Well, unjust compared to what kind of criteria? That's and the criteria like, uh, 30 minutes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and the, the criteria, of course, depend on specifically on, on our understanding of human nature, human wants, human needs, etc. So as Diogenes Laertius puts it, the goal becomes to live according to nature, that is according to our own nature and that of the universe, that's where natural law comes from. So in the end, is academic skepticism in this particular case, a philosophy of life, a similar parallel analysis could be done, of course, for Pyrrhonism. I think the answer in general um, is that it is a fundamental epistemic attitude toward knowledge claims, toward uh, how to live your life, how to build a just society, et cetera, et cetera. But in Cicero's version in particular, which is, as I said, this eclectic mix of mostly Stoicism with a sprinkle of Platonism and Aristotelianism, it does become a coherent system and therefore a philosophy of life. As Cicero himself put it, let the welfare of the people be the ultimate law. And I'll leave you with this. Thank you very much. And let's open to discussions. Thank you so much, Massimo. We have.
uh, really eight minutes now to discuss. Now, I'm wondering, given that, in fact, we have just 54 participants as against the anticipated 200, whether it will be possible to to kind of see Judy between Judy and I, um, people who put their hands up or um, people who want to just ask a question using voice. Um, so I'm going to invite people to do that um, rather than using the chat function. Um, so yeah, Michael do does have a question already, however. What's that? Michael, Michael has a question already. Michael, do you want to ask it? in? Yeah, person? and then I can see a hand with Felix as well. So we've got a queue developing Michael and then Felix. If we keep the questions relatively brief. So yeah, sorry about that. I guess I actually have several questions in, in uh, uh, but the one, basically, one was if you, as you stated in the outlet, Massimo, and thanks for your for your fascinating talk. Um, Thank you. If all some philosophies and religion must have a metaphysics, and I would prefer to speak of an ontology, I think. What's the still what's the skeptic ontology? Yeah, uh, I would also uh, my 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 understanding of skepticism is basically that it's all about the assertion that there are limits to our knowledge. Right. And yes. if that's the case, then I'm not sure how people like Sagan, Descartes, Spinoza, and Russell could ever be said to be skeptics. Uh, right. Well, let's set aside Russell and Spinoza and all that because they're not part of, of, the, of this talk. Um, that, that's, a, that's a long discussion that we can have separately. In terms of the kind of skepticism that I pre presented here, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's a good question uh, to pose, but I think the answer is in the positive. And yes, we're talking about ontology, of course, by by metaphysics, I really meant ontology. Um, you know, the academic skeptic, if you just look at, again, at, at what we uh, have from Cicero, it does go into metaphysics. It does, you know, write about, um, you know, the nature of, of the universe. It does uh, write about, uh, for instance, he criticizes the skeptics about, uh, sorry, the, the Stoics, about um, their belief in divination, but at the same time, he also writes on the nature of the gods, etc. So, they do have a metaphysics in the sense of an ontology, but of course they would say this isn't necessarily the truth. It's just the most likely uh, scenario, the most likely thing that I can come up with, right? So it's it's one of the highest level of persuasiveness uh, that that we saw in um, in uh, in one of my slides, and that's one of the reasons why I like actually uh, the skeptic, at least the academic skeptic approach. Uh, as opposed to say the straightforward sto stoic one, because the Stoics are so damn sure of, of what what or at least appear to be so damn sure of uh, of their their ontology, which uh, at least a number of aspects of it can certainly be questioned from a modern scientific perspective. So this, so Cicero repeats over and over. He says, you know, I retain the right to change my mind about anything I say if new evidence and new arguments come up. So. I don't think there is a contradiction there in holding provisionally to what you think is a likely or persuasive ontology, provided that you are willing to change your mind and update things if if uh, there is significant you know reasons to do that. Okay, thanks. Felix, well, uh, yeah. Massimo, thank you, great discourse. My question um, comes uh, in terms of epistemology, and uh, I mean, the classic attack from the skeptic towards the Stoics was there are no cataleptic impressions, so no impression right. can be self-evidently true. Uh, how do you counter that from the skeptic perspective? I find that cataleptic impression approach so that there are some impressions that are so overwhelmingly true, the evidence of that they are adequate is so overwhelmingly true, I find that convincing. I think some axioms in mathematics might be something if linked to each other uh, that that could be cataleptic impressions. How do you counter that from the skeptic approach epistemically? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, again, this is a long discussion, but I actually do think that the skeptics were were right um, in, in this. Uh, so the problem is it's always conceivable that what you think is absolutely cataleptic, true, and all that sort of stuff, it turns out not to be the case, right? Now, first of all, mathematics is actually an interesting question in of itself. I think that a good argument can be made that there are no cataleptic impressions about mathematics either. And the reason for that is because it's one thing to say things intuitively. Let's say, you know, two plus two equals four. Sure, that sounds pretty strong. That sounds pretty pretty cataleptic, pretty obvious, right? But then if I try, if I ask you to prove it, 
right? To, to give me a, a logical proof of it, as you know, Bertrand Russell tried and it took him 200 pages to, to, to show that. And of course, in 200 pages of a proof, it's not that unlikely that you're making a mistake somewhere. But setting um, mathematics aside, uh, in terms of sort of real world experiences, empirical empirical stuff, I think that one can easily make the argument that one should never be a hundred percent certain. I mean, you know, the the, the the degree of persuasion. The, the nice thing about the skeptic system is that the degree of persuasiveness can go as high as possible as you want it to be, right? 99%, 99.9%, 99.9999%. I'm very confident, for instance, that right now is partly cloudy and late afternoon outside in here in New York, right? I'm really, really seriously confident about that. It's, it's really difficult for me to imagine otherwise. But at the same time, could I be dreaming this conversation? Could I be hallucinating could i be mistaken because maybe there is a you know moving that they're that they're uh, filming out there it's not that unusual in new york and so it's brighter than it might be in sexually night yeah it could be right now i don't necessarily i don't think the skeptic is uh, bound to consider it seriously anything that doesn't that that uh you know to question seriously i guess anything that is that highly persuasive right before i i start questioning whether it's really day out there or late afternoon out there i have to have some serious reasons for right that that decrease my level of confidence is my level of confidence is 99 percent of above i'm fine i'm good i, I i'm okay but as uh, my brief mentioning of um bayesianism uh, becomes relevant mm. here because, of course, according to Bayesian theory, you can show mathematically, right, that um, if you touch the two extremes of 0% confidence or 100% confidence, you're basically stuck there. It means that no further evidence or arguments can actually move you away from the two walls, which is why Bayesians try not to go to the two walls, because those become statements of faith, essentially, not not uh, not, uh, re not statement of reasonable probability. So. Um, okay. I think that's a reasonable answer on the part of the Stoics, but okay. uh, sorry, of the skeptics. But as I said, this is just the beginning, so it's a great question. I, I, I'm going to be getting back to you by the end of the sabbatical now year and, and see what I think. Thank you, Kylum. Did you have a question before we go to your presentation? Oh yeah. So um, my question is about whether Massimo, you think there can be sort of a pure skepticism where you sort of impartially see uh how things come out or one thing that's characteristic of cicero he's sort of like a bayesian in that he has some priors he's got some real commitments as a roman to virtue to to certain sure. political organizations and then those sort of structure at least as i read him the way he applies skeptical methodology and and where where he comes to so um yeah. Yeah, do, do you think there's a pure skepticism or, or for it to really be a way of life, do you kind of need to start with some commitments and then maybe examine them using skepticism or there's an, there's an interaction between them, but, but it's not sort of this, this, this pure um, or fleshed out way of life on its own? Right. No, that's a great question. Uh, no, I don't think it's possible to be pure anything, uh, especially in the in the context of what we're talking about. I mean, that would require sort of God's eye view of things, and and you know, uh, it's just not a human thing. That one of the things that I find attractive about skepticism is that it is it, an, an acknowledgement of human epistemic limitations. It's, it's a it's a form of humility of epistemic humility, and therefore it's virtuous from that from that perspective. Um, however, that doesn't mean that the so so in order to answer in part your question is yeah that's right cicero or any other skeptic has to start somewhere you have to start with some commitments right with and but but that's true also for scientists let's say it's also true for mathematicians logicians right you always start with axioms or with with assumptions but so long as you reserve the right to question eventually to go back and question even some of your own assumptions or 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 axioms or starting points then you're fine right so i think that cicero uh it, had he lived in a different time for instance he might have said oh okay I, I think i need to question you know this this certain starting points that i took for granted as a sort of provisional way of building my system but as it turns out the facts are such that there are problems with with those so i'm going to have to replace them or i'm going to have to modify them um so ideally, I see 
a skeptic as holding on to assumptions because you have to, otherwise you don't go anywhere. But at the same time, treating those assumptions just like uh, the skeptics treat everything else as provisional. Um, you have, a, of course, if you're taking something seriously as an assumption or as an axiom, as a starting point, obviously your degree of persuasiveness for those is very, it's gotta be very high. Otherwise it doesn't make any sense to treat them as assumptions, but it's never hundred percent. And therefore, if somebody says, but wait a minute, there is actually a good reason to question one or your own assumption, then you have to say, okay, sure. Uh, let's, let's do that and see what happens. Massimo, thank you so much again. Yep. Um, we do need to bring the session to to a close. Uh, and as I say, obviously, many of these questions will continue to to return, I think, in different contexts. I notice there's a discussion concerning um, cosmic consciousness that has been going on in the chat, for example. Um, but it is time. Um, thanking Massimo once more, um, if we can, um, virtually, however one does that, um, to, to pass over to our next speaker, uh, who's also been an interlocutor this morning. Um, it's fantastic to have Caleb with us. Uh, he's one of the leading authors, I think, on philosophy as a way of life. And he's an associate professor of philosophy at the Metropolitan State University of Denver. And he has, uh, as I see, begun a project on Augustine and ancient philosophy. And I take it, therefore, that the paper that we're going to hear, whose title is, Does Augustine Give Up Wisdom for Faith? the relationship between uh, philosophical life and religious ways of life is going to draw from that project. So Caleb, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so first I wanna note there's uh, a number of passages I'm going to refer to, but won't have time to um, fully read over. So I posted a handout in the chat. Um, it's, it's a little while up now, but you can um, refer to that as, as we go. Um, and I think my talk kind of follows on nicely because it's about another kind of, uh, of limit case, not, not the skeptical one in, in this case, um, but about whether this um, religious way of life is philosophical, what's the relationship between um, Augustine's uh, Christian way of life that he comes to um, out of philosophy, out of pursuit of wisdom and uh, the traditional uh, ancient philosophical ways of life. Um, so that's both a question in intellectual history and also in ongoing debates about how to interpret what's involved in philosophy as a way of life. So we have um, on the one hand, uh, Oh, what my, one of my dissertation advisors, John Cooper, whose um, pursuits of wisdom kind of concludes with Augustine as, as ending the, the era of philosophy as a way of life, um, because he sees Augustine as sort of giving up on philosophical thought and understanding and re replacing um, that with this kind of psychological need for a personal God and father. Um, and not really uh, seeking salvation or the good life through living and acting well. Um, but on the other hand, you have people like Peter Brown, famous um, bi biographer of, of Augustine, noting how important wisdom was as the central goal and organizing um, concept. Um, and I think the question of whether Augustine's continuing philosophy as a way of life or giving up on it um, is actually pretty straightforward when it comes to the early Augustine. It gets a little compl more complicated um, la later on. But if we look at Augustine's first encounter with philosophy, as he reflects on it in, in writing the Confessions, his autobiography, um, he notes that when he was reading this at 17, it, it, it changed his life. Um, reading Cicero's Hortensius, um, Cicero's version of, of we had Aristotle's Protepticus mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, we I, like Aristotle's Protepticus, we've got a limited record of the Hortensius, much of which comes from Augustine. Um, 
but it's this exhortation to philosophy to love and seek and pursue and hold and embrace with all my strength wisdom itself um, and that's really what augustine takes from it and then um, in some of the earliest works we we have um, these dialogues from the Kasikiakum period right after augustine's conversion to, to christianity um, he, he still sees the, um, what he's doing um, as philosophy and sees philosophy as, as necessary for, for a happy or, or blessed life. Um, and especially at this point, I think he's really pursuing this Socratic way of life where um, you think that the best life for humans, uh, as, as John himself puts it, is to, um, pursue wisdom and we see that um, in this uh, contra academicos where uh, Augustine is responding to the academic skeptics that Massimo was just talking about um, and there defines wisdom as um, the right way of life that it is going to be guiding and then takes from Cicero this idea of wisdom as a knowledge of divine and of human things and the knowledge of human things is the uh, knowing that the four cardinal virtues of of the stoics so so far um we've got a very continuous view with um the stoics in particular um there's also Aristotelian and Platonist elements, the idea that the best human life is going to be the one that perfects the mind or reason, um, and that achieving wisdom will allow us to um, subordinate our desires and, and, and live in control. Um, and like Socrates, Augustine would say he hasn't yet attained wisdom. Um, uh, as he says in the third book of Contra Academicos, but he thinks um, he's got a real um, shot at it and, and is re represented as something that's attainable for human beings, even in this life at this early stage. And several of Augustine's early works are devoted to what kind of order of study do we need to achieve wisdom? Um, and it's also a fairly stoic view insofar as um, at this point, Augustine doesn't think uh, you need externals for happiness. And he does think a, a goodwill on its own would give you a kind of joy and satisfaction that would make for the happy life. Um, but it's also uh, platonically influenced insofar as his definition of virtue isn't so much um, externally directed action towards others or political virtue, but instead this more platonic idea of virtue as this act of looking or or a vision, something that's that's more internal um, than rather than something directed directed outside. It is looking to the self and and then in looking to the self, then um, looking looking to define. So I think so far we have um, a view of wisdom that's quite continuous, um, but there are some important aspects that come from Augustine's Christianity where he's challenging and critiquing some of the ancient philosophical ways of life um, and presenting the Christian religion as sort of a better way to achieve the goals of philosophy. And then um, as we'll see, as his thought develops, um, his, uh, his views on what wisdom and the intellectual virtues look like uh, and what's attainable change as well. Um, so in this early work on true religion, um, he emphasizes the unity of um, philosophy and religion. So um, here he presents the true religion as, as the way to the good and blessed life, to what's acknowledged as the goal of philosophy, achieving a, a good and, and blessed life, as you sort of have to have both um, philosophy um, about the sacred and have some kind of sacred rites or practices that connect with philosophy. And we don't have time to fully get into his critique, but he thinks um, pagan philosophers such as Socrates and, and Plato had these philosophical insights but didn't fully carry them through to challenging existing religious practices and social structures um and he sort of brings in 
um, Christianity and the example of, of Jesus as this thing that didn't just convince the philosophical elite, um, but was able to convince um, ordinary people, all sorts of people to believe that we should love the unchanging good more than images and changeable things. And he thinks, well, look, if, if Plato could see someone doing this, he'd think that that's amazing and divine and there must be some kind of power there. Um, and he thinks, well, either Plato and the Platonists would just become Christian or if they didn't, that would just be out of pride. Um, so, on, on this picture, um, he also takes as uh, at this point in his career, Jesus is sort of the paradigm of what living a good life looks like, and in a way that challenges um, a lot of our assumptions that we need honors, we, you need children, you need um, money, you, you need to avoid pain. Um, the life of Christ for Augustine is sort of pushes back against all that. Um, and instead sort of shows the kind of wisdom and virtue we should really value. Um, and so his conclusion in that work is that there's not one thing called philosophy or devotion to wisdom and another called religion. Um, in fact, they go together. You, you, you've got to have your understanding of God and the universe right to practice religion right. Um, um, but also if you've got the right philosophy, you also need to connect it up to um, rituals and practices in the right way. Um, and at this point, um, Augustine sort of thinks ultimately you can come to understand and use your re reason to, to, to reach wisdom, but you kind of start with authority because that's the place to begin for those who, who, um, don't know. Um, and so, He's not saying you should ultimately accept everything on, on faith or authority, but he's saying that's sort of the way to start, just as the Platonists would advise you to trust, trust Plato, trust the process of reading this dialogue, and eventually you come to understand things um, for yourself. It's similar to that with Augustine and, and reading the Bible, reading sacred scripture. Um, so that, that's his early thought, but then he comes um, to think he was too op optimistic about what's achievable uh, in, in our current life. Um, the, the nice but also difficult thing about Augustine is, is we have this record where the, the, the retractiones, where he goes back through his works and, and tells us what he'd like to change or what he disagrees with now. Um, and one of the things he disagrees with is the idea that the kind of knowledge or wisdom we can attain now is good enough for, for happiness. He thinks that's wrong. Um, he comes to think uh, the status of our bodies and our relationships um, with others really matters to our happiness. Um, and the, the Stoics just wrong to think that virtue of the soul is good enough for, for happiness. Um, and then in fact, uh, we might seek to achieve virtue and understanding, but the kind of virtue we can achieve in this life is so limited. It's it's really just restraining our 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 vices and our and our and our bad tendencies. Um, so I want to look at how that changes his way of life, and then um, whether it ends up looking less philosophical or more religious um, by focusing specifically on the case of knowledge, wisdom, and the intellectual virtues. Um, so in the City of God, here we see him um, referring to this Stoic division between logic and physics and, and ethics um, and acknowledging that the philosophers have made some great discoveries there, but he thinks they didn't figure it out well enough to get to get all the way there. Um, and it, because he comes to think that we can't fully attain wisdom um, in this life, he ends up sort of setting the bar for um, intellectual excellences lower than a lot of the Platonists or Aristotelians would be, and in a way a, a little more similar to the, the academic skeptics. Augustine is, is one of the first to actually defend the value of testimony and be willing to say we can actually know things through um, our bodily senses and um, testimony. Otherwise, he says, we wouldn't know 
um, that there's an ocean that um, he often gives the example of Constantinople, um, which he's never been to. We wouldn't know it exists um, without testimony. And so he he says, not just our bodily senses, which some doubt, um, but even testimony can contribute to knowledge, to scantia, something the, the early Augustine, who's who's more influenced by um, Plato and Aristotle and these ideals of um, complete and exact philosophical knowledge, now comes to think, well, maybe we can't get that perfectly. So, so we need a sort of more appropriate standard for, for knowledge. Um, and he comes to distinguish um, wisdom, sapientia, as intellectual cognition of eternal things. So it's where you come to understand um, unchanging things, um, most of all God, but but it, it could involve your, your grasp of other unchanging truths. Um, and then knowledge, uh, scantia, um, in, in, in this sort of what he takes to be a theological sense he's he's interpreting some passage from from paul here then is is what covers practical matters it's it's sort of like um prudentia or phrenesis um practical wisdom that covers rational cognition of temporal things as augustine um defines it but it's not going to be as an exact and certain as as um phrenesis is for for aristotle or the stoics um it is instead what you need for right living, um, but in this somewhat negative sense, um, uh, it's the knowledge by which this willful life is so conducted that one may finally reach the truly happy life, which is eternal. So, so you don't have to um, grasp what's right in this um, perfect way to do, to do um, everything joyfully as the virtuous person would for Aristotle. Um, instead, you just have to make good enough use of temporal things to sort of prepare you for, for um, this future life, which will involve acting with courage, with moderation, with justice, with wisdom, and pursuing the kinds of knowledge you need for that, but also recognizing that sort of knowledge is, is fallible. And there, there are some skeptical influences. Um, so, and here in this later work on, on the Trinity, um, Augustine says, well, if you choose wrongly, if, you're, if your practical knowledge gets things wrong through ignorance of temporal matters and does not keep to the limits it ought to in its action, this is only a human temptation and is therefore very easily forgiven. So he comes to think um, sort of errors about matters of fact, um, where you're trying to act, say, generously, or you're trying to help someone, but you might um, make a mistake because maybe maybe you got bad testimony, or um, maybe um, your your senses did fail you. Um, in those kind of cases, uh, there's a kind of failure of the result, but. Um, we, we just sort of have to acknowledge our fallibility and. If it's only because of a, a, a failure of that knowledge, it's it's not that more morally serious a failure. Um, so then um, the picture Augustine um, presents when he when he puts this uh, together um, in book 19 of the city of God, where he's both critiquing the philosophers and, and giving his own perspective, um, he wants to reject uh the new academy the skeptical academy that takes all things to be uncertain um and instead say that there are um three kinds of things he thinks uh we should accept and and treat um as certain first of all he thinks there are certain things that can be grasped by the mind and by reason um but very little so unlike say Aristotle, who, who thinks um, we can achieve completed scientific understanding of, of um, well, the basic structure of reality and a number of its parts. Um, Augustine, against the skeptics, thinks we can have certain knowledge um, uh, about some things, but it's, it's very limited. We can have, I can have certain knowledge that, that 
I'm knowing. There, there's um, Augustine's version of the cogito argument. So there are aspects of my own mind that I can know, um, but it's not a completed knowledge of a whole scientific discipline. Instead, um, it's just a few things I can sort of know by by self-reflection. And then he thinks we should believe the bodily senses and evident matters. Um, since the one who thinks they're never to be believed errs more miserably than the one who believes them. So um, he does, unlike the Stoics, con concede to the skeptics that uh, there aren't sort of any infallible signs as to when we should um, trust our senses. But he thinks in general, we do better trusting them than not. So, so, so um, uh, when, when things are evident, we should, we should go with it. And then finally, this um, religious case where we should trust in divine testimony. Um, but he's with the skeptics when anything that, that we don't really perceive by reason or our senses um, in an evident way. Um, and then he says, here he put, in some other places, he puts it positively that we, we can also trust um, those whom, whom it would be absurd not to believe. Here he puts it negatively. Um, it's um, it's fine for us to doubt things that don't come from witnesses whom it's absurd not to believe. So there, there's a certain role for testimony, but whether you trust someone's testimony or not is is fairly contextual. Um, and so we can kind of contrast the ultimate goals of our knowledge, which really is quite similar to Plato or Aristotle, where the the best state is one of, of wisdom where you get in intellectual cognition of eternal things, um, but that's not fully achievable now. If we got it, um, it would be transformative, um, but we're not yet at that state. Um, we have understanding or scientia in a theoretical sense, but about a very limited set of subjects, a full understanding of reality. Again, we have to wait for for the next life and more divine illumination. Um, and then Augustine thinks we can achieve practical wisdom, but only once we define it in this more limited way of sort of cognition of temporal things that's good enough to act on, um, but is not safe. So um, he thinks there are many cases where you'll be trusting sensation, but you 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 could be deceived and, and it's not certain, um, but it's, you're, you're more rational acting on it than, uh, than disbelieving. Um, and then similarly with testimonial and sensory knowledge, he, he calls them notitia. I think, and this is an interpretive question, but he thinks, I think he thinks they re it really is a way of knowing the world, um, but it doesn't give you full understanding. Um, it's not necessarily safe or certain. So uh, a lot of the intellectual states he thinks we're gonna be operating with in our life are, are more limited than what the philosophers were hoping, um, but a little bit more like what Massimo was talking about with, with the academic skeptics, except that Augustine is really holding out hope of um, achieving full wisdom and understanding um, in the next life. And he also disagrees with the Stoics about whether we can make progress um, in wisdom. So in this, this passage, um, he mentions the famous Stoic metaphor of, of the drowning person who it doesn't really matter how close you are to the surface, um, you're, you're, you're still foolish as long as you haven't gotten above the water, whether you're uh, an inch below or, or half a mile. Um, but then Augustine gives his own um, metaphor. Um, it's, he says, like that of a man proceeding from darkness into light on whom more light gradually shines as he advances. So long, therefore, as this is not fully accomplished, we speak of the man as of one going from the dark recesses of a vast cavern towards his entrance, who's more and more influenced by the proximity of the light as he comes nearer to the entrance of the cavern. So on this view, um, it's true that we're never going to fully attain wisdom in this life, um, but Augustine thinks we can meaningfully compare and say that one person is, is wiser rather than another to the extent that they've um, sort of more in touch with the light, more, more, more illumined than the other. It is a picture of gradations instead of the all or nothing of the Stoic um, wisdom 
or foolishness. So I think that's something that really changes from the earlier to the later and a way in which Augustine wants to say, although wisdom isn't uh, attainable, there is a sense in which we can call someone, and and he thinks scripture does call people in this life um, wise or foolish or wiser or foolish than another in, insofar as they're progressing more towards towards that goal. So um, I think in a way we do get this sort of redefinition of the intellectual virtues where he defines down some of the requirements for, for practical wisdom, allows more testimonial and, and sensory knowledge in um, than, than Plato and the Stoics might by um, loosening up some of those conditions, part, partly to, and conceding some ground to the skeptics that some of the skeptical challenges are right, um, but that the response is just to admit that our intellectual states maybe aren't aren't as good as some of the philosophers had thought. Um, but the philosophers are right to really desire and want that unchanging wisdom and understanding. Um, and there, even though Augustine emphasizes their pride more in the later works, I think he still thinks they have the goal right, and they still should be, um, and we still should pursue both the Christian and the philosopher are pursuing wisdom, um, which we really see in this um, important passage from on the Trinity, where after again making this distinction between practical knowledge and um, wisdom, the contemplative wisdom, which he says is distinguished from knowledge or um, man's wisdom or practical wisdom. Um, and here's where we get one of um, the few places we, we, we have some fragments of Cicero's Hortensius, um, which says, this is what Cicero was setting up as the goal, um, that we sharpen the understanding and take care that it does not get blunt and lit we live in philosophy. Either that we will have a cheerful sunset to our days, um, if this capacity of ours to perceive and be wise is perishable, or if we have eternal and divine souls, as the ancient philosophers agreed, and the greatest and far away the most brilliant, we must suppose that the more these souls keep always to their course, um, and the less they mix themselves up in the vices and errors of men, the easier will be their ascent. And then we get Augustine's commentary where he critiques Cicero's suggestion that you could um, be happy living in, in philosophy um, if, if our reason and wisdom turned out to be perishable, then we just couldn't achieve our goal and it, we'd be losing something we love and we, we'd, we should hate that, that loss. So he, he rejects sort of some Stoic and Epicurean reasoning there, but he thinks, Cicero and the philosophers are right that we should desire above all things wisdom and pursue it through reason and inquiry. Um, but where he's, he's changed is in no longer thinking that um, through our own efforts, we can um, through reason and inquiry get, get to this wisdom. Um, for the later Augustine, it's, it's through grace um, and the mediation of of Jesus, both as as the one who gives that grace and then um, gives sort of knowledge and direction to us through the scriptures that's that's going to allow for that. So I would say the goal really doesn't remain the same for Augustine, but his view on the means um, changes quite a bit from, from the early Augustine, where it is through um, dialogue and reason, and it looks very um, Socratic and Stoic and Platonic, to uh, the later Augustine that's both uh, significantly more pessimistic about what we can achieve um, and comes to emphasize um, not just our human efforts, but the, the need for help from um, our communities around us and, and um, from God's help and direction. Um, and so it is this more communal view of the 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 way um, way of life that that changes, and this idea of yeah relying on revelation and the divine as opposed to accomplishing things by our own efforts. So I think there are questions about whether that really 
changes this way of life so that in some ways it's it's not philosophical but if you just take a philosophical way of life to be one that that aims at wisdom, um, I think you can still make the case that um, even this later, more pessimistic Augustine um, clearly uh, takes himself and Cicero to share the same end, the end that he was inspired by at the age of 17, um, seeking seeking the truth and wisdom where, wherever that leads. So I'll, I'll leave things there. Thank you very much, Caleb. For that presentation and it's very um timely as well in fact you hit 30 minutes on the on the nose which gives us um plenty of time for discussion and with so much content i, I imagine that there will be many questions um so if people could virtually raise their their hand or uh, in, in some other way make themselves known to judy and i please do so Massimo, I think, is that a clap or a hand? Yeah, that's a hand. But uh, <laughs> I think um, Matteo has a question first. Judy says. Okay. Yep. Matteo. No, I, I was actually clapping. So please. <laughs> <laughs> Uncertain okay, impressions. Uh, Uncertain you can impressions. consider my yeah. clapping as well as raising a hand. Um, okay. So, you know. It's. I really enjoyed your presentation, and but it really crystallized once again. Although I hadn't, I hadn't thought about Augustine in a while, why it so much puzzles me. I mean, uh, you know, the third thing that he says we absolutely should believe is scriptures. Like, really? Um, that seems like hardly the conclusion of a you know critical thinker or philosopher or whatever it is. That would you would think seem to me to be one of the lowest ranking in terms of persuasion uh, uh, that I can think of. And then more importantly, perhaps, uh, we cannot be happy if we die. Uh, lots of philosophers argue exactly the opposite, right? That that it's beginning with the Stoics, Seneca, for instance, or the Epicureans. Uh, that, that what gives meaning is precisely the fact that it's going to end. And did he, I mean, what's your take on this? Did, did he not considered these possibilities seriously enough because of his religious conversion background, however you want to call it. Uh, it did consider it somehow had an arg principled argument, but I don't, I don't see a principled argument there. So, so what, what's your take on on that? Yeah. So, uh, I actually, I'll say something about the second question. Um, briefly, but I, I've got a whole paper I'm working on because he does explicitly consider what if it turns out that we're mortal in, in book 13 of on the Trinity. And there his conclusion is then no human life would, would, would turn out to be, to be happy. Um, and I read him as very influenced by, um, the idea in the symposium that we have this desire to possess the good forever. So when I enjoy something good, it's built into that enjoyment that I, that I want it to persist. And then um, either, well, if I don't want it, persist, it to persist, then it's not really good. If it is really good, then then I want to hold on to it. Um, and so he sort of responds to this um, stoic argument that for um, acceptance, when it's your time to go um, by, he, he sets it up as a trilemma. Either your life ends against your will, not against your will, or neither um, for nor against your will. And then um, he tries to argue that in all three cases, it will turn out that um, uh, dying ru ru ruins your happiness. So, so, um, and yeah, right. I, I don't but have time to fully go through it, but. Yeah, yeah, but, so, but, so, but, but that seems mm -hmm. to me just bad psychology. It's just not the case, empirically speaking, that uh, we can, the human psychology can hold something forever or for very, very long periods of time. We, ju we don't sustain anything uh, for very long periods of time. Yeah, so I think that's true, but I think he's partly drawing on this Platonic Aristotelian tradition that thinks there is something about humans sure. that is kind of divine and that is capable of in engaging with the timeless and eternal. And I think that's there from the beginning in the way he's drawing on, on Plotinus and these other thinkers. And so at least I would say I don't see this so much as like a, a Christian or everlasting um, view 
debate versus versus like a philosophical mortal. I, I think it's more an internal debate that that people like Plotinus would be on the same side as Augustine and in, in thinking there are these best activities that really go beyond the human and, and mortal and 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 could in in principle be extended indefinitely. Um, and Augustine is is with them and against those who think that meaning comes through through limits and we have to ex um, accept our finitude. Fair um, enough. You, you want to comment briefly about the, the scripture stuff? Yeah, so there, um, I think I want to say what happens there is that he comes to think that we're never going to get wisdom in this life, so faith then becomes more important as providing a, a sort of full guide to how we are to live, even though we're not in a position to fully understand and and appreciate it. So, um, uh, yeah, and there's a lot more that could be said about, about his defense, but I think a crucial move is he'd agree that you didn't need faith or maybe you shouldn't put so much reliance on divine scriptures if we could. Um, figure out how to live and all that on, on our own. So, so big part of his his case is is seeing that project as a failure, and then thinking there are good reasons to think that there's a divine agent who's who's um, gi giving us some special help with with that testimony. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kayla. We've got a question um, from Michael in a moment, but uh, Alison has put something into the chat, which I think you can you can see, and and she's asking, does the identification of truth with a particular yeah. person in the Christian tradition, as in I am the way, the truth, the life, change anything about how Augustine thinks about the nature of wisdom or its object? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, I think it it does in several ways. Um, to begin with. In some of the quotes I had had up there and that are on the handout in on true religion, I think it's really important for how Augustine thinks um, this way of life can be accessible to everyone because everyone can connect to the story of Jesus and appreciate it in a way that he thinks not everyone has the time or leisure or inclination to pursue sort of the philosophical arguments that would lead you to see that timeless unchanging goods are, are better than, than, than changeable ones. Um, or he thinks there are good arguments for the immortality of the soul, but even among the philosophers, the Platonists get it, a lot of other people don't. Um, so that sort of replaced with this very um, concrete uh, picture of, of, of this life and, and, and of what the, the good life, um, looks like, and then, and then being able to, to connect to, to a person. And then for him, the incarnation in which, um, the divine has assumed human nature uh, can then also make us confident that human nature itself can be perfected and fully good in a way that, um, say on, uh, Platonist or some other views where um, humans um, are like pretty far down the cosmic hierarchy and you might wonder how far up we can get like some Platonists think we can maybe move up a level, but we're not going to get anywhere near the highest good. The fact that the highest good comes down and fully unites with our human nature and then is able to fully bring it up to the highest um, is is really important as well. Thanks, Caleb. Michael. Yeah, thanks. Um, and that was a great presentation. I just wanted to get back to this to the point that you that the way you were discussing with Massimo about whether Augustine's contention that for something to for an item of knowledge to be fulfilling, it has to uh, remain retained eternally. And you cited this as being part of the Platonic or Aristotelian tradition. And I'm afraid I have to disagree there. Um, I think Pierre Radeau has shown that um, the Stoics and the Epicureans are following Aristotle when they argue that the greatest pleasure, the greatest knowledge has nothing to do with duration. duration. If uh, knowledge is complete, if pleasure is complete in any given instant, then it can't possibly be increased by further duration. And that's precisely what justifies the, the point that Pierre Adot has discussed so often about this doctrine that only the present is our happiness. It is, that's the case only because the pleasure we can derive in an instant is strictly equivalent to the pleasure that we could derive in a billion years. Yeah, so I think this is tricky in Aristotle, and it's 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 something I'm I'm working on as part part of another ob, um, project. But I think it is worth making a distinction between two claims. Uh, 
one would be that there is an increase um, that you get by the activity being being temporally extended. Um, and I agree that that one is a little more suspect philosophically and, and, and textually. Um, but I think where Augustine and where I read the tradition it's coming from is, is you can also make this negative argument that um, if you're doing this best activity, then even if it doesn't um, sort of get better by being longer, um, there could still be something bad for you in having this activity interrupted. Um, and I think that it's pretty clear in, in book 10 of the Nicobian Ethics that Aristotle thinks it's it's bad for you if you know you have to stop contemplating to uh, go take out the trash or help help your city be ruled well or or, or, or whatever. Um, so at, at least for Aristotle and for some some Platonists, um, I think, yeah, as, as you say, things things well, I think things are maybe more different from the Stoics and Epicureans than them, but I think you can argue for it in this negative way that you're you're losing out if you stop the best thing, even if it's not like the best thing is changing or becoming better um, in continuing. I don't recall Aristotle saying that, that, he, that it's bad for you if you can, if you have to stop contemplating, you do, because that's the part of the negative of the human condition. Uh, and in that sense, that's one what separates us from the gods. But I don't recall him ever saying, and that's a bad thing. That's just the way things are. That's all. And well, fact, but our, I, the only the close and well, given our limits, the closest we can ever come to a state of divinization is precisely by contemplating. And we could be, and according to the tenth book of the Nicomachean Ethics, we can come awfully darn close to divinization precisely mm -hmm. by contemplating. And part of the reason is because we that this moment of contemplation abolishes the importance of time. And thereby abolishes the different, the major difference between human beings and the gods. Yeah, I'm in agreement on that last part. Um, but I do think part of his evidence for the superiority of this activity is that it can um, go on in, in a more interrupted way and for a longer time than um, than all these other activities that aim at ends outside themselves. Um, and if you think at the way I see his model, he wants the polis to be set up to um, not just maximize the number of contemplators, because on your picture, it sounds like as long as if we have a thousand people and they all contemplate at least once, then 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 that's just as good as a city in which a thousand people, you know, each contemplate for, for 10 years. Um, but I think just the, the way he thinks the Polish should be structured and a lot of things he says about um, Phronesis ordering things for the sake of Sophia imply that there that there is some value in, in duration. But, but there, there are a bunch of texts there we'd have to get into. Thanks. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks, Michael. We're coming to the end of our first session. Um, I certainly want to invite um, anyone who, who wishes to, who needs to, to leave. The, you know, this is what we call a soft exit in the world of Zoom, I, I take it. Um, however, um, I, I'd certainly be happy if there is any final final question for for that to be posed um, to either Caleb or to Matteo or um, indeed to Massimo to finish the session. So are there any final thoughts or comments that people want to proffer at this time? The floor will be yours. Is that a hand somewhere? Yeah, that's me, uh, Tom Brockelman here. Hi, Tom, please. Yeah, so I actually wanted to return to um, the first paper and the comments on that, which I found fascinating, the notion there that, you know, on the one hand, as I've read before from Hado himself, that, um, you know, physics demanded conversion and that the kind of contemplation that um, uh, philosophy as a way of life demands is somehow uh, takes place in part in nature. It seems to me an interesting proposition from from the ancient world but then also i wanted to to ask if you know clearly ado and foucault you know had a kind of conspiracy to agree that then for the mo you know for the moderns in some way in opposition to that uh, we could reduce um philosophical truth to to um, discourse and it seems to me that there's a kind of there, there may be a space between those two extreme positions and i'd uh, love for Michael or uh, for for any of those involved in that uh, early discussion to uh, see ask their response to that. Is there is there any kind of uh, space between this extreme one of seeing 
contemplation as a movement out to nature in the first place. And uh, on the other hand, um, the notion that uh, the philosophical truth seems to be purely um, discursive and that's purely uh, subjective. So just want to open the floor on that. Matteo, do you want to, in the first instance, respond? Yeah, I was actually thinking um, about the question. Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, so for example, um, I, I wouldn't see the two, uh, the two as necessary, um, you know, uh, as alternatives, I would say. Um, so for example, I, I uh, uh, perhaps I haven't I haven't gotten precisely what what you're aiming at with with your question, but um, someone like Hado has no problem um, saying arguing on the one side that, for example, um, there is uh, I mean physics the, the discipline and sphere of physics was in itself a big part an important part of of the philosophical life for some authors, and at the same time uh, that. Uh, Philosophy at a certain point in time and its in its history became uh, identified with some discourse. I mean, in a sense, I think for, for me, uh, in fact, that's that's why I try to uh, give a lot of emphasis to the notion of conversion because that, I think that's, I mean, it's a very explicative. Um, it has a lot of explanatory potential as a notion. Um, mm, but also, perhaps I am. Could could you reframe the question? Perhaps I'm. I'm yeah, I'm sure. No, I think you're actually down. responding to it. I mean, I am looking mm. for 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 uh, middle ground, as it were. Right. Um, because it seems to me that one can come up, come up with a kind of extreme position, where on the one hand, some of the ancients, particularly the Stoic tradition, represent this notion of, um, uh, where where philosophy, way of life, is made possible by movement of the mind out first to nature, to being. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the other hand, the kind of modernist, a kind of pure modernist subjectivism on the other hand, where you know everything starts in the subject and there's no acknowledgement of nature per se. I, I, I think there have gotta be in between positions and, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that we could interpret Addo to take such a one or other thinkers. I'm just trying to see what that, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm asking people to, to try to, uh, to respond to that, to see if, if they can articulate some of those positions. Thanks, Thomas. I'm aware that I think Joseph has had a hand up for some time, unless that is a, a long-standing clap. Um, Joseph. Yes, indeed. It's a, uh, it's a, it was a raised hand. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. And I have a question on Caleb. Namely, I would like to ask, uh, in what sense can we say uh, of Augustine's way of life that it is a philosophic way of life, if in, uh, in fact he takes the most important matters uh, on faith? Uh, as a Christian, he knows uh, that the fundamental fact of our life is uh, our sinfulness, and that the decisive event of history is Jesus' sacrificial death, and that uh, the way of life uh, that uh, that we uh, have to live is uh, ha uh, has been preordained to us by the teachings of the church. So, in my mind, there is there is a decisive difference between uh, living philosophically between uh, between living by uh, by well by ex examination. Mm -hmm. And by taking uh, taking uh, uh, the prescriptions uh, for life uh, from uh, from outside uh, on faith or or on some other authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's crucial for his response that uh, faith is not our, our final state or our goal, but rather sort of given our situation, it's it's um, the best the best guide we have. So, he, as I read him, he accepts all the requirements on wisdom. You have to fully understand things. The, the 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 person who achieves wisdom will see for themselves. They won't be relying on any kind of external authority, divine or otherwise. So so that's where he wants to get to. Um, he just thinks we can't get there. Um, yet for for a variety of reasons, and also I think for him. He thinks Christians who 
just sort of stick with faith and then don't then seek understanding and try to move towards um, wisdom are are living in in a deficient way that's maybe good enough. Um, but I think that's where it it still comes together for him that you shouldn't be satisfied um, just with believing things on on faith, but there should be that continued quest to try to understand some of these assumptions that you you've you've taken on faith and um, and move towards uh, a real understanding through through better meditating on on the self and um, the divine. Um, and one of the things I want to work on is actually on the Trinity and uh, Augustine's sort of exploration of the self as as kind of continuing this tradition of meditation and spiritual exercise, but now directed at seeing the, the Trinity within the mind and then using that to get up to the divine in a way that isn't based on assumptions, but it but is based on 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 personal experience. All right, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Caleb, uh, just to kind of um follow up on that some of the the early christian the fathers and so on um and some of the early monastics describe christianity as philosophy uh, i'm just wondering as a terminological note particularly in the later augustine is that is christianity still described as as a form of philosophy or does he in his growing distance perhaps from his earlier more as you say um i guess uh you know dialectical approach and uh does he does he does he begin to say that christianity no no we can't even describe it any longer as a philosophy it's it's something else it's beyond philosophy um as a terminological point is that a move he makes um not really i would say he's quite consistent on the way he uses beatitudo which had taken over from the stoics um to mean the the happy life that's safe and secure, and Sophia as as the state of knowledge about about the highest things. Um, so so there, uh, sort of formally, his description of, of of the target is 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 very consistent. Now, how much he thinks this like practice we see in the world now of what's called philosophy, how far that can can get us there, um, is uh, maybe changes. But if you think of the root meaning of just this pursuit of wisdom, there, there, I think he's 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 totally consistent in thinking that's what we need to be doing. Um, um, he's just less convinced that the so-called philosophers were, were were pursuing wisdom in the right way. Okay. Um, are there any perhaps one one final question? Then I think we will will finish off the, today with with a view to continuing with uh, Michael Chase, John Sellers, and Laura Miller tomorrow. Um, but any Michael has thoughts, Michael has the, the hand up, unless it's a leftover from before. So I say again, Massimo. Uh, Michael has his hand up, unless it's a leftover. Oh from yeah, I, yeah. I, I I took it that that was from before but michael is that a new no hand? no that's actually i'm afraid that's a, it's actually a new one a new um, hand if, if i if i may just, just as a real quick follow-up to the last uh, comments i think it would be interesting to, to look closely into augustine's use of the term vera philosophia which is a pretty common term in uh, in, uh, in uh in Augustine's early thought, but in general, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it seems really interesting to me that in, in our at least two of our three contributors here seem to be of the view that there really isn't all that much of a difference between religion and philosophy, which I think is a very interesting position. Of course, that's what a lot, uh, one of been, been one of the main complaints by critics against Pierre Hadot's, uh writings in general that oh well, what you're doing there is not really philosophy; it's mysticism; it's some kind of religion, or so forth. But then, on the other hand, uh, none of nobody has mentioned so far one of Hedro's most controversial theories, which is that it was Christianity that spelled the end of philosophy as a way of life. Uh, that philosophy as a, was a, was practiced as a way of life in antiquity, and that goes down the drain, basically, and uh, says Hedro in his early writings, when uh, we have the rise of scholasticism and philosophy becomes the angela theologiae, the handmaiden of the theology. Now, I'm going to assume that our two correspond our two contributors who believe that philosophy and religion uh, are very pretty close would dispute that claim. Uh, is that the case? <laughs> 
That's interesting. Um, no, I wouldn't dispute that claim. I actually agree with, with Adele, and I guess I should cl clarify uh, what I said earlier. I see philosophy and religions as having a family resemblance, but not as being the same thing. Um, so there is a gradation. And I think what makes the gradation in at least in part, is precisely how much does one rely on arguments and evidence and all that sort of stuff, and how much does one re rely on allegedly revealed scriptures, right? So a, at one extreme, I guess, one could put something like Stoicism, where there is no no scripture, there is no nothing. It's like, okay, it, we, we need to look at the world as it is and reason on, on that world. At the opposite extreme, th there are some versions of Christianity, certainly... Um, over over the centuries, where uh, reasoning comes only as an afterfact, it comes as you know philosophy as the handmaiden of of religion. It, whenever there is a conflict uh, between the two, the revelation trumps philosophy. When when you get to that point, you are as far as you're going to go, uh, and uh, in 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 the direction of of religion. So I see that as a continuum. I was in my talk. I was interested more in the similarities um, in order to broaden our discussion in terms of uh, what kind of activities we're talking about. But no, I wouldn't go as far as saying that there's no difference uh, between philosophy and religion. So I would agree with Ado that it was Christianity that historically shut down everything else. But that's partly also because it had the power of the Roman army behind it. So, Caleb, do you want to have the, as it were, the last word of this session? Um... Uh, and I think Michael's question really well does bring together um, many of the things that have come up. And this is something, you know, this is obviously a really vital issue. As Michael's pointed out, this is one of the ongoing, I guess, criticisms that we can face when we work on philosophy as a way of life, this, this um, you know, flattening of any distinction between philosophy and religion. At the same time, of course, as in fact, Hutto has a, a very particular view of Christianity's role in, in, in fact, changing the game. So, Caleb. Yeah, it's it's a really big question. I'll just say two things. One is to keep in mind, you know, the variety of practices and attitudes within Christianity. Um, it, yeah, definitely a spectrum um, for less and more philosophical, and those that are more self-consciously thinking of it as a way of life, and and the way that ascetic practices are are. Some of them taking taken over and modified um, from philosophy, as as Ado himself um, talk, talks about, um, but then trans, transformed in some ways. And certainly, in some ways, there's a greater role for authority. Though looking at late Platonism, there's a pretty big role for authority there as well. So, so, so I think that might be more a matter of gradation. I think things do change somewhat in the high scholastic period, where you have someone like Aquinas who wants to very clearly differentiate between what philosophy can achieve through reason alone, and then understands theology as as being about um, uh, a kind of scientific discipline you have uh, based on on um, God's knowledge and and divine revelation. So there, they're really I think. Uh, that's one area where there's a real difference between Augustine and Aquinas, um, and they're they're much more separate and distinct um, in a way that makes philosophy itself less formative and more of a handmaiden than the way that um, Augustine, especially in his interpretation of Platonic philosophy as really longing for the infinite, um, sees it as much more continuous with theology. Thank you, Caleb, and, and thank you so much to all of our three speakers and for everyone for, for their attendance and, of course, also the discussion. Uh, we will finish off now, but tomorrow we'll be back in 22 hours, um, and I hope that, um, that we can continue. In fact, I know that we'll be able to continue some of these discussions. And as I say, Michael, John uh, Sellers and Laura Muller will be speaking to us tomorrow. We're kind of moving forward roughly in history. Uh, which is the way that the three days have been um, uh, established. So uh, have a good 24 hours and I'm looking forward very much to seeing you all and to continuing the discussion tomorrow. But thanks again and yeah, bye for now. Thanks a lot, Matt.